Now, as you're turning in your Bibles to 1 Timothy, I want to just give you a little background on who I am. Uh, I have been around Calvary Chapel since the mid-70s. Um, as a teenager, then I attended there with my wife, uh, Catherine, who was with me through the 80s. There she is. I see that hand. Um, yes. So we've been married for 35 years. We have three adult daughters, uh, 29 to 34. We have seven grandkids. And... Um, I pastored Calvary Chapel Portland for 23 years and I am sad to say that this is the only the second time I have visited your church um, but Mark served as my missions pastor before he came to be your interim pastor uh, but I have known Mark for almost 30 years since our time together at Calvary Costa Mesa now, all of that history is amazing. And maybe many of you have walked with the Lord for many, many years. Maybe some of you are newer Christians. Um, my phone is blowing up. I don't even know. Mark is, Mark is totally distracting me right now. Mark. <laughs> Now, what I want to talk to you about this morning is something that the Lord is preparing you for, and that is a new work. Now, we love that phrase, right? How many times we think of through the scriptures where God says, I am going to do a new thing, right? That is a common concept. And we know that God loves to do a new work. If someone is just getting saved, we say that they're going to be made a new, a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5. Old things pass away. All things what? Become new. We'll just treat this like it's a small group. <laughs> but there are other times when God says through his word or one of his writers that he's going to do something new when it appears as if he's talking about something old. I think of 1 John in uh, chapter 1 of 1 John where John says, Behold, I give you a new what? A new commandment. And then he turns right around and says, but I'm really giving you what? Old. An old commandment. I think of make up your mind. What is it? <laughs> is it a new commandment or is it an old commandment? And those are the kinds of things that I loved discovering uh, when I was a new Bible teacher and just really getting into the Word. And why did God say things like that? Why didn't he just say what he meant? Why did he make me have to work so hard? And I just learned that that's just the way God works. He wants me not to be so lazy, and I need to think about it. So when John says, be, I'm going to give you a new commandment, but it's really an old commandment, what does he mean? And I think that passage really applies to you. And by the way, John was pastoring in Ephesus, and Timothy is pastoring in Ephesus. And that's the connection. But John was saying, God is going to take something that is old and make it new again. And that is what God is often doing. And I think of, I think of even in my own life, I've grown up in church. I grew up in a Baptist church in the Los Angeles area. My wife grew up in church. Her father is an Assemblies of God uh, minister for... 50 years, retired now, uh, uncles, missionaries, college deans, pastors. Uh, we got married, attended Costa Mesa through the 80s, um, pastored for all these years. Now, I, even though I could have kept pastoring my church, Calvary Chapel, Portland, I wanted to uh, join a ministry called Poyman Ministries. Now, Poyman just means pastor. And so I have become a pastor to pastors. Now, how many of you know that pastors need help? 
<laughs> Amen. <laughs> Especially in our Calvary Chapel system, every pastor is considered an independent leader of that church. We have no denominational system, you know, no headquarters to, to get orders handed down from. That's good. We are independent and free to follow the Lord. The downside of that is that independence can create an isolation and an unhealthy isolation. And I can tell you that over the years, as a pastor, I needed help. And there was often no one for me to call who would pastor me. Oh, there were plenty of people who had opinions. <laughs> no shortage of opinions. But someone who understood what I was going through and could give me real, practical, or spiritual help. And so I pastored from the ages of 35 to 59. I'm 59 now. And I just thought, Lord, what do you want to do with the, the rest of my years? And I just felt urgently that I wanted to help other pastors. Whether it's a Sunday off, or a sabbatical, or maybe they need someone just to give a kind of an outside look at their church and what are the strengths and how can they help their church. Um, and so that's what I'm doing now. I resigned from my church at the end of last year. Uh, I travel and visit churches. I was in, in Gresham about a month ago. I was in McMinnville a couple of months ago. Uh, I was in Baker City, Oregon, and spent a week there doing a church assessment. Then I filled in in John Day. They don't have a pastor. We have over a hundred churches, Calvary chapels in Oregon and Washington. That's a lot of churches, isn't it? That's a lot of churches. Hillsboro, Beaverton, Southeast Portland. Now I know most of the pastors, at least in this general area. Um, Lincoln City, Phil Magnon down there, I know him. Jason over in Astoria. Um, and the Lord is working in all these small towns and small and medium and large churches. Friends with Daniel Fusco in Vancouver. We are each trusting that God has placed those pastors in that city to do a unique work. And that's what we believe in Calvary Chapel. Do you believe that? Yeah. We believe that God raises up a leader to do a unique work in that place. We have that confidence. Now, in some ways, the work is common in each of the churches and each of the cities. We know we're preaching the gospel. We want to see people saved. We want to see people grow in the Lord. But then you look at the calling of each pastor, and each pastor, just like each of you, will have a unique calling on your lives. What will it look like? What will preaching the gospel and making disciples look like in your life? What did it look like in my life? And so, what I am reminding you of is that God is bringing you a new pastor. And in some ways, there's going to be a continuation of work that has been going on for years. But in other ways, it's going to be new. And that's the hard part. Because if you've been part of this church for a long time, you're excited about the idea of a new work, but it's going to challenge you. Are you aware of that? because that's not the way we did it. <laughs> and so because I'm a guest speaker, I have the luxury of coming and offending you and leaving. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can be bad cop today. <laughs> and so I understand the challenge of thinking you know how it's going to go and and then there's just, well, we, that's, we don't, 
forth. And the littlest things will upset you. Amen? So when it happens, just be prepared that this is the normal course of things. But God delights in taking something that is established or old and making it new or making it fresh again. And even though it's exciting, it's still upsetting. But our confidence is in the Lord. And I will tell you, it's the same thing for my wife and I. We are going through a change in our life now where we have been, you know, walked with the Lord for many years. We've been in ministry many years. We had everything set, and now it's all changing. We are in this transition of not being at the church, visiting other churches. I got my real estate license just to support myself because I don't really make any or much money with Poiman Ministries. It's all support-based. And I'm often going to churches that don't have any money. And they're the churches that need help, right? And so I am completely trusting the Lord. Uh, but it's exciting to go visit churches and to be here with you this morning. Now, why did I have you go to 1 Timothy? Did you ask that question? Yes. Why don't you ask me that now? <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> now, I do know. This little letter is from the Apostle Paul to a young pastor named Timothy. Now, it's special to me because God has used it in my life over the years to get me refocused whenever I might be discouraged. And there are some basic things in here, instructions, that, I, that Paul is telling Timothy to get Timothy refocused in a time of discouragement. Now, if you know basically the relationship between Paul and Timothy, Paul is traveling on his missionary journeys. He goes to Timothy's town where he lives. Anybody know for extra, extra bonus points? Don't say Los Angeles. Lystra. Yes, the gospel is needed there. Lystra. Timothy lived in Lystra. You know his mother and grandmother were Jewish, taught him the scriptures. His father was Greek. And when Paul came to Lystra, Timothy would have seen Paul do miracles, preaching the gospel in the area, and seeing the power of God firsthand, which is what I saw during the Jesus movement. I was a young man, you know, a teenager, seeing thousands and thousands of young people come to the Lord. I saw it with my own eyes. Timothy knew the scriptures. Paul was so impressed with young Timothy. Timothy was led to faith in Jesus Christ by the Apostle Paul, which is why Paul would call him his son in the faith. Timothy traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys for years, and eventually Paul left Timothy in the city of Ephesus. He expected for a short time to pastor the church there, to oversee the church. And Paul expected to go travel on somewhere else and come back. But Paul was delayed. And during that delay, Timothy became discouraged. Now, I can't think of a much better Bible college experience than having been trained on the job by the Apostle Paul. Can you? When you think of a pastor getting discouraged, you think, well, we, we have these easy, quick answers. Oh, he wasn't pray, prepared properly. Oh, he's probably not praying enough. Or some snarky answer that really reveals that you don't understand the demands of ministry. Every pastor goes through ups and downs. Every pastor sees floods of people come in and floods of people leave. If you're in the ministry long enough, you see it all. No one is exempt from trials, just like no Christian is exempt from trials. They're just magnified in the ministry. Timothy 
hits a hard spot. Now, just put it all together. He's away from Paul, his spiritual father. He is away from his family in Lystra. He's in a city that he doesn't know especially well. He is facing a, a new level of a weight of responsibility he has never faced before, which is always a shock. You think, yes, I want to lead this ministry. God, I'm ready for it. And you are shocked to find out the pressure that comes with that, that responsibility. He's facing difficult people within the church there, which I know there are none here. Don't, don't keep eye contact with me now. Don't look away. There's always strong-willed people, which is fine. Just bring it under the control of the Spirit. That's meekness. And you just put all this together, and Timothy is, is discouraged. And I might even say by experience, he might be willing to quit. And the fact is, every young pastor feels like quitting. At least once a week. <laughs> We just don't tell you. <laughs> and so Paul writes this letter to get Timothy restarted to make the ministry new again. What amazes me are the things that Paul tells to a pastor that he should already know. There are seven things that if you're taking notes, I want to give you this morning that became rock-solid principles that I, I applied to my own life that would get me restarted. Because how many of you know that when you're really discouraged, you question things you never would have questioned before? Right? Okay, God, do you love me? God, if I pray, are you hearing me? God, is your word true? If you get discouraged enough, you might even question your salvation. And I know some of you are saying, oh, I would never do that. Well, just wait. The key verse of 1 Timothy is in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, the theme verse or verses for this little book. I write to you so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He's saying this to a pastor. I'm writing you this letter so you know how to act in the church. Really? That's how silly this sounds. So when you think of the scripture where Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what? Power, love, and a sound mind. Connect that Paul is saying that to a pastor. When we read these scriptures, we just think of them as promises of God. Things that help us when we're upset. But at some point early in my ministry, I realized that Paul was saying that to a pastor. Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When Paul said to stir up the gift of God that was given to you by the laying on of hands, he was saying it to who? A pastor. That's how practical this is. And many times I was discouraged and had to figure out how to restart. When I didn't feel like it, or I questioned things that I never questioned before. I could count on these things. The first one is so basic you already know. But Paul reminds Timothy to teach the Word of God. Now this is a hallmark of Calvary Chapel. This is who we are. 
And he says in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Verse 4, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification. Again, Paul has to remind a pastor to preach the word. And what I ask is why? What's going on in Timothy's life? What's going on in your life when you start to neglect the word of God? Is it that you stopped believing it was God's word? Or you stopped believing that you should be reading it? No, not really. Something else is going on. Now, as you read through this chapter 1, you find out that there are other loud voices in Ephesus. And there are others who consider themselves to be experts in preaching. And it's always these loud, dynamic experts that seem to get all the attention. And in fact, in this culture where Timothy is, the Greek culture, they loved the public orator. They loved the new, you know, speaker that comes to town. You remember when Paul talked about uh, Acts 17, where he was in Mars Hill, a similar situation, where they would gather because they loved to what? Hear and tell some new thing. We love the new thing that tickles our ears. The new thing that tickles our ears. And the, the listeners in Ephesus especially loved the speakers who had these new original ideas. And here is Timothy, a preacher, and, and our, preach, our job as preachers is to not come up with new ideas. Right? Our job is to deliver the old ideas with a fresh power of the Spirit. Just as your challenge as a Christian is to consider the old scriptures with fresh conviction and fresh application to your life. It's a constant challenge. And Paul is telling Timothy, still have confidence in the simplicity of God's Word. Now, what is it that's amazing about God's Word? Only God's Word has the power to change lives. There are lots of philosophies and principles and books that are exciting and thrill us, but they don't have the power to penetrate the heart and change our lives. And that's what we're counting on. Godly edification, which is in Christ. Edification means to build up. My job this morning is not to thrill you or excite you or just make you laugh uh, or just make you uncomfortable, but it's to get something into your heart that will make you stronger in your faith in Jesus Christ. However I do that, whether I offend you or make you laugh or whatever, I'm, I'm shaking you up. That's all I'm doing by my amazing oration skills. <laughs> Pretty, yes, I know. <laughs> Verse 5 gives the real goal of Bible preaching. 1 Timothy 1.5, the purpose of the commandment. Right there, Paul is telling you, this is what you should be expecting. Timothy, if you do your job. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Love. There's different kinds of love. You guys know this in the Bible. There's parental love, brotherly love, physical love, but there is divine love. The four different Greek words for love that C.S. Lewis gave us. We're not looking for brotherly love that we like each other. We're not looking for parental love. We're looking for a love that only comes from God, can come from God, and that is divine love, agape love. It's love that can't be faked. It can't be manufactured. 
and I would challenge you as a longtime church in this community, is how is God going to make give you a fresh love to reach the lost of Newburgh? That is an, that's always a challenge of a long-time existing church. You've probably tried outreaches and they didn't work. You, you've been here so long, you're thinking, oh, those people, they don't want to hear the gospel. But guess what? God wants to make it new again to reach those people. Those people who don't know they need to be here. A genuine love for the lost and a love for each other that's new. We could go on and on there, but it is just a pure heart, forgiveness of sins, a good conscience, which is free of guilt, and from sincere faith, which is free of any fake pretense. Fake pretense. Sincere is a combination of two words that means, that is sine sire. It literally means without wax. I know you, that's, you're supposed to look at me like that, like, what? What does that have to do with anything? The sculptors would work with marble and they would be fashioning uh, a statue. Do you remember this story? How many of you know this story? A few? They might get near to the end of making this statue that has been commissioned or they're going to sell of a Greek god or something. And by the time it, they're getting near to the end, the chisel might ship and uh, slip and knock off the nose or something. Well, they've put hours and hours, maybe hundreds of hours, into this this sculpt this statue, sculpting this, and now it has a flaw. So the sculptor would get some wax, pick up a handful of marble shavings off the ground, and make a fake nose and put it on that statue and sell it like that. And someone might buy it and take it home and put it in the front yard and what would happen on a hot day? <laughs> it would get a runny nose, that's right. I have never used that joke before. No. Write it down, I, have. I use it all the time. But it became just common. If you're going to buy a statue, make sure it is what? Sincere. It is sincere. It is without wax. Paul is literally saying, be a Christian who is without wax, who is sincere. And whatever, nobody has perfect faith here. We all have flawed faith. And I am thankful that whatever God does in my life is not dependent on my perfect faith. Many of you are insecure about God's promises in your life because you think it depends on you. It really depends on the faithfulness of God. And even the smallest amount of imperfect faith is effective in laying hold of the promises of God. Amen. That's what grace is. Grace is not received because you were good enough, because your faith was some trophy faith. But don't be fake. Be who you are. And that is tremendously attractive to the lost, that you can be a genuine Christian and love the Lord. Well, I still have six more. Do you have time? Okay, we'll go faster. The second reminder to Timothy, and uh, my, my subtitle of this message is The Things That Timothy Forgot. First, remember the power of God's Word to change lives. Secondly, it's a reminder for Timothy to fulfill his calling. Fulfill his calling. It's in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 1. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Now that's connected to preaching the word, but it's also connected to the fact that he personally has been commissioned by the Lord to a task. And that is true for every one of you. 
God calls every one of you to a particular task. And the challenge is, will you fulfill it? Will you fulfill it? Ephesians 2.10, by the way, same city, same church. For we are His workmanship, God's workmanship, created unto good works, which He has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. You are God's workmanship. He is shaping you to prepare you for a good work which He's prepared beforehand that you're going to fulfill. Now, I just said to a pastor two days ago, you don't get to choose your calling, but you do choose whether you're going to fulfill it. God has set out a calling for your life, and you don't have to fulfill it. Maybe you've tried, and you got tired in it. Maybe you got discouraged because it didn't quite go the way you thought. But there is a choice, day after day, week after week, year after year, to stay the course on what the Lord has called you to do. And you know what that is. I find out that most people really know what that is, even though they keep it secret. Timothy needs to have confidence in the power of God's Word. Secondly, he needs to stay focused on what he is called to do. And frankly, as a pastor, we're often temp tempted to try things that other churches are doing or other pastors are doing because they're attracting people. And it starts to become a comparison and a competition. And Paul said to the Corinthians that those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. The fruit will come in what you're called to do. The third reminder is all of chapter 2, and it is the priority of prayer in a church. In verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And so then he goes on all of chapter 2, to expand on the priority of prayer. When he says, first of all, he's saying of high priority, pray. Now, it's not just saying, Timothy, are you praying? All of chapter 2 is talking about getting the church praying. Pastors pray. I prayed this morning to get here. The question is, is prayer getting into the church? Are you engaged in prayer? Or are you waiting for the church to bring or the pastor to bring it all? There's usually a few people in the church that do all the work and all the praying and everyone else shows up to see what's going to happen. I showed up to see what was going to happen. <laughs> Paul touches on three results in Ephesus that are going to come out of a church that prays. Now, there are many outcomes. There are many things accomplished. But Paul touches on three important things. One is peace in our daily lives. This is where he talks about praying for those in authority, right? Why do we pray for those in Washington, D.C. and in Salem, even if you disagree with them? Well, let me say, Paul says, so they leave you alone to live your lives. It's a very conservative concept, isn't it? <laughs> so that we lead quiet and peaceable lives. It's not just peace in my heart as a Christian, but peace in my business, peace in my family, so that Rome is not showing up with more taxation and all this other, you know, interfering in my life. So pray for those corrupt rulers so that you can get about your business. Amen? You could have had a little more energy with that. Amen? Amen. That's right. We're going to be Pentecostal today. <laughs> the second important result of prayer is that the lost are saved. 
We don't want to have peace in our daily lives and tell Newberg to leave us alone. No, we both want peace in our families, our homes, and we want to go out there and see the lost saved. Amen? Yes. We can have both. It's not, it's not one of the others. Uh, it's too easy to isolate as a Christian. And the third outcome of prayer is that it pleases God. Isn't that a good reason to pray? Amen. How many of you often feel like you are falling short of pleasing God? Isn't that a constant nag in our hearts? We feel like we're falling short of pleasing God. That's the very definition of sin. And often we feel like that when we are not sinning. Some people need to feel like that a little more. But I find the average Christian doesn't have peace in their heart because they just feel so inadequate. Well, isn't it great to land on one thing that I know pleases God? Well, if, and I just want to, let's do that. So pray. The fourth reminder, I'll keep moving. And this is all of chapter 3. The fourth reminder, Timothy, raise up more leaders in the church. In verses 1 and 2, Paul says to Timothy, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop or elder or overseer, all the same, he desires a good work. Now, in Bible study and Bible reading in your personal lives, this is one of those chapters you might skip. Because it's the qualifications for elders and deacons. Which you might say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm going to skip this chapter. In fact, it just makes me feel bad to read this chapter. Because the first qualification as an elder is that a man must be... Say it. You know it. Blameless. Well, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> blameless. Because we know we're not blameless. Or are you? If I am a new man in Christ and I'm now living in obedience to God's word, am I blameless? Yeah. Nobody's born blameless, but it really describes the man who has been changed into the image of Christ. Now, let me give you just some general application from this whole chapter to all of us, men and women. Men, of course, the pastor needs more elders. And we're it's generally talking about men, okay? Husband of one wives, and we see that men are the, should carry this spiritual oversight of the church. One of the things this tells me about Timothy is he's acting alone. That Paul has to tell Timothy, you need help. I find this is common in small churches I visit around the Northwest. Pastors become discouraged and they isolate. And it's surprising how many of them say, I don't have any help. I don't, it's hard to find elders. And I, I often will, will remind them, you do have elders, you need to find them. There are men in the church who can be spiritual leaders. They just don't know it yet. What this also tells me to all of us, men and women, is that we should all aspire to godly leadership of some form. Men and women. And whatever influence God gives you, it needs to be accepted, owned. And if you're a leadership ty a leader type of person and you have influence, number one, it needs to be reflecting the character of Jesus Christ. Always. Because at the end of this chapter, when Paul says, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh, that's what he's saying. 
Whoever becomes a leader in the church, follow the example of Christ who demonstrated the character of his Father in human form. So we're all doing the same. We are manifesting. Godliness means God-likeness. And when you are a godly person, you are in the flesh showing the character and the nature of God. And that's, that is the, the example of Christian leadership. Parent, Sunday school teacher, worship leader, pastor, elder, women's ministry leader. We are all showing the character of Christ. The fifth reminder, this is all of chapter 4, and this is directed at Timothy individually. And so, take this personally. 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says to Timothy, exercise yourself toward godliness. Now this is a direct, this is not about the church, this is not get the church praying, this is not find leaders, this is Timothy, I need you to exercise toward godliness. Now what, what does he mean by that? In this chapter he says, bodily exercise profits a little, profits some, but Timothy, you exercise yourself toward godliness. One of the things that happens when you're discouraged as a Christian is you start to neglect your own spiritual growth. Is that true? You don't often mean to. You didn't set out to backslide or to pray less or have devotions less. It just happens when you're tired. And what happens when you stop growing is it affects everyone around you. Do you know that? It affects everyone around you, whether you're a leader or not. And this sounds like a strange thing for me to say that pastors can start to neglect their spiritual growth. <laughs> Because they show up week after week with messages. We preach the word. We pray for you. We show up at the hospital. But the pastor himself may not be growing. And it doesn't mean that God isn't working through him. But fatigue sets in and it's not the same. Now why does that happen? It does happen. And it doesn't mean that that pastor has become carnal or he's, you know, horrible in some way. It doesn't mean he needs to be fired. He's just a person who is tired from running the race. And the best ordinary life example I can think of is a mother with little kids. Automatically, you know what that's like. When my wife and I moved here to, to Portland, we had three little girls, six, eight, and ten. <laughs> three little girls. And she worked, taught, taught school at Faith Bible Christian School in Aloha. And now they have kids. And a young mother, who is a faithful mother, is spending all of her energy taking care of those kids, right? But what happens to those young mothers? They're often not taking care of themselves because they're taking care of their kids. And pastors are really similar to that. Everything is about taking care of you. Which is why I feel called to go and be a help to the pastors. And I'll say to pastors, when was the last time you had a Sunday off? I met a pastor in the Phoenix area. He planted the church uh, six years ago. When I met him, it was a year ago. He says, well, I've had two Sundays off in five years. That's just wrong, isn't it? Nobody can continue that pace, and he works a job. Faithfulness might kill you. You think you're so important that you can't take a break. Plan a vacation. 
And so sometimes I just come and give a Sunday off or a couple of Sundays off. So Paul is telling Timothy, exercise yourself toward godliness. He's taking a word right from the Greek culture. Exercise means... Um, Gymna is the word gymnazo. I almost forgot it there. Gymnazo, which means to exercise naked. Now, isn't that a wonderful spiritual lesson right there? <laughs> gymnazo means to exercise naked. But really, the Greeks loved exercise. And in fact, Ephesus, by the way, is the home of the Olympic Games. So this is immersed in this culture of exercise and discipline and regiment. And the men would exercise naked to show the, per the, the perfect and imperfect parts of their body because they're developing the perfect man, the Greek culture. Well, the Christian is not the body first and the soul to follow, but it's the inside first. It's an, a foreign idea for a Christian to have a workout plan for their spiritual life. We like to read our Bible when we feel like it. If I can, if my, my goal in life is to grow as a Christian and mature and become the person God wants me to do, to be, to do the work he set out for me to do, I need to make a plan to get there. Does it make sense? Well, what's your plan to get there? Oh, I don't know. And we hate the idea of a plan. We want to be spirit-led. How about being spirit-led to make a plan? <laughs> At the end of the chapter, Paul tells Timothy what will happen if he attends to his own personal spiritual growth. Verse 12, chapter 4, Let no one despise your youth. You're going to get respect. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you through the laying on of hands, which is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Timothy, you need to be saved. Saved, saved? No, just saved from being drawn back into the world. Saved from the discouragement you're in. And by your being, this is really the definition of revival, Timothy is going to be revived, and by doing that, it's going to revive the church. Amen? Amen. The best thing for a church is a growing pastor. A growing pastor. Two more. I'll make it brief. Number six in all of chapter five is the reminder to Timothy that the church needs to be a family. At the beginning of chapter 5, he says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. This is another kind of odd chapter. It's how to attend, take care of widows, honoring elders who teach the word. It's kind of a smattering of general things about people in the church. But the core of this is relationships within the church. How do we treat each other? Churches often struggle for identity. What are we supposed to be? Are we a social action committee? Are we a political recruiting office? Are we a corporation? Churches struggle to know, well, who are we? What are we? What are we supposed to be? We are a family. 
most of all, we treat each other like brothers and sisters. And that's tremendously helpful. And you know, when people want to join the church, they just want to belong. They want to belong where people love them. Very, very attractive. The last reminder, all of chapter 6, number 7, is a reminder to Timothy to protect the church. Protect the church. Look at the end of chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Now, all of this chapter is like chapter 1. It's a warning against false teachers. And at the beginning of this chapter, he specifically addresses the wealthy in the church. Anybody here wealthy? You don't need to tell us. <laughs> but God blessed, blesses people with money. There were the wealthy at the church at Ephesus, and they were teaching a personal philosophy that they had become wealthy because they were more godly than other people. That is not true. But there are people who believe that even today. Well, the reason I am successful is because I'm just more spiritually mature than the rest of you. Just, just say, God bless you, brother. <laughs> because you've just told us you're not as spiritually mature. If you don't know that whatever you have is because of God's grace, then you have not learned the lessons of grace. And the quicker you learn it, the quicker you will know what to do with the resources God trusts you with. I am really thankful. I didn't even, I just, not in my notes, but I have, my wife and I have been able to be in the ministry we are because of generous people that we know that have given to us financially. I got my real estate license, but that's not really providing a little bit. But we know people who feel so, so supportive of the ministry that we're doing that they've given to us financially. And I'm able to go visit churches. So God works through all of us and the resources that we have. But this was a problem in, it, in the church in Ephesus. That the wealthy were becoming prideful and it was affecting the church. And Paul was telling Timothy to stand up to them. You don't want to correct the wealthy in the church. What if they stop giving? Right? Every pastor has that challenge. If false ideas and prideful ideas get into the church, it's over anyway. It's just over. This last reminder to Timothy is to protect the church. Guard the church as a shepherd would protect the flock. Now, I love this little book because it's just a good reminder of things that are necessary for a healthy, strong church. It's not because I know anything about your fellowship that needs fixing or correcting. But I often deliver this message to many of the churches I go to. It's just a good refresher. It's like starting up the NBA season and we're going to learn, we're looking at, we're, gonna, we're just going to cover the basics again. We're going to go back to training. And what are the basics of playing the game? These are the basics. And it's, it's good to learn them. And I just, I just, my confidence and my hope is in, is in the Lord has, has chosen a man and his wife, and they are going to come to this place, and they are going to be saying, Lord, what do you want to do in this church and in this city. And I pray that you are praying the same thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.